When I was in high school, I was a runner, which may be hard to imagine today. You see, it was a private school, and everyone had to be on a team if they ever hoped to graduate. And through a painful process of elimination, running was my team. Now, I tried other things, you know, sports with equipment and spectators who aren't related to you and ones with that folks care about and follow as a matter of course, but a total lack of coordination doomed me. And I settled into the North Yarmouth Academy cross-country team where I stayed for six long years, from seventh grade to twelfth. Now before those years were over, I was made varsity, thank God, and I was elected captain twice, But in all that time, I never won a race. And not only did I not win a race, I never finished higher than fifth on my own team. And furthermore, my team never won a race in all six years. The whole team. Continuing an exercise in futility that began before I arrived and after I left. My brother was on that team for another four years. But we didn't despair because the running sports are a little bit different. Their mythology, their stories, and their heroes cast winning in a different light. We don't need Herodotus to outline its mystical dimensions, though it's nice when he does, when Phidippius falls in with the god Pan. You see, even in high school, we knew that losing meat after meat didn't make us losers. It just made us better. And maybe that's why when I read these sports references in the Bible, I tend to lean toward that one by Ecclesiastes. Now, if the Bible were a youth soccer game, bear with me, okay? If the Bible were a youth soccer game, at first glance, it would be hard to imagine Paul and the writer of Ecclesiastes getting along. Most likely, they would try hard to keep out of each other's way, maybe with the occasional grumble or curse under their breath or an eye roll. Either way, they wouldn't be friends, really. Ecclesiastes, you see, is philosophical about the situation. He has trouble taking the game all that seriously. In the fine tradition of the tortoise and the hare, he would tell the kids from the comfort of his lawn chair, well back from the sidelines, that there's more to life than this. There are larger fish to fry. The race goes not to the swift, he tells us, nor the battle to the strong, nor bread to the wise, nor riches to the intelligent, nor favor to the skillful, but time and chance has happened to them all. But then there's Paul. And Paul would be as far from Ecclesiastes as he could yet get, probably standing right up next to coach, taking a son or a daughter, maybe his son or his daughter, or maybe yours, taking them aside to give them real-life correction and instruction, watching the score and the children's technique, barely keeping it all in, waiting for that moment to pop into action and to fly, if only slightly, off the handle. Do you know, he says, that in a race the runners all compete, but only one, only one wins the prize. Run in such a way that you may win it. Now, of course, the writers of the Bible had never heard of organized youth sports the way we know them in Natick today. And they never thought to give us clear instruction about how to get to the top of our chosen field of competition, whether it be physical or mental, social or financial. They were interested in other things. That's why they got in the Bible. They were speaking more globally. These are classic sports metaphors about a life well-led, one filled with love, with grace, and with dignity. 
knowing this as we do. They no longer seem like rivals. In fact, they are not as contrary to one another as we might think at first. We know from his letters that Paul was not, in fact, a high-pressure sports dad, but a spiritual thinker, reminding us of the importance of dedication to living a good and holy, profoundly spiritual life. That is something can, that can be accessed by everyone. Athletes, he goes on to say, athletes exercise self-control in all things, and they do it to receive a perishable wreath. But we do it to receive an imperishable one. And he would agree, too, when Ecclesiastes points out one of those hard facts in that reading that we heard about living in the world saying to us that so much of our lives is, in fact, unpredictable. Which means, to paraphrase Ann Richards, being born on third base isn't the same as hitting a triple. And you can't ever get a home run if time and circumstance prevent you from getting up to bat. Now, I realize those are baseball metaphors. And I slip into them from time to time because that's what I do. And perhaps the Bible would have been shorter and much more clear if Paul and Ecclesiastes also had access to the rich language of America's pastime, but they didn't. So instead, they went for something else, something more elemental, something more egalitarian, namely the image of the great race. The great race. And that image truly is egalitarian, isn't it? Human beings will make a race out of anything wherever two or more are gathered. Now in previous sermons, granted some time ago, we talked about how kids will drop sticks into a river on the upstream side of a bridge and then rush over to the other side to see which stick wins, which one comes out first. And most of us here have probably raced sleds over an elm bank during the winter, just because we can. And we race cars, and we race boats, and bikes, and skateboards, and remote control planes, and we race our own bodies. We measure our speed. Not for a trophy, not for a perishable wreath most of the time, but for something else. We are measuring ourselves against ourselves. We are doing nothing less than testing and improving our own piece of God's creation. Now this does happen in other sports too, but other sports have rules and are complicated. Racing, in its essence, is very simple. So never is the connection more clear, and never is the net cast so widely. And this brings us to that other reading today, and to that massive symbol and metaphor of the running world, the marathon. Run, Pheidippides, one race more. So it turns out, like we said, that the traditional marathon story isn't true, or at least not in the literal sense, which is the case for many things that we talk about in church, let's be honest. It was a run to Sparta and back, a journey of a roughly 300 miles, not a mere 20-something mile sprint to Athens. And while Pheidippides did meet a god, he didn't die of either exhaustion or joy. But the legend, Robert Browning's legend, did spawn an institution and a sport that holds a unique place in our culture. And when I say our culture, I mean the culture of humanity, because every corner of the globe has its marathon. 
and all kinds of people from all walks of life find ways to take part in it. You can even watch the Boston Marathon, an international sporting event, for free. For free. You just walk right up and you can see it. Take that, Fenway Park. This is where the truly broad church of sport sees its greatest triumph. It is inclusive and affirming, and it is dominated in the rankings by people we have never met and do not see or hear anything about on a regular basis. In our own marathon, the one that runs right through our town, the only marathon that, frankly, most of us pay attention to, the most famous runners in the race have been former members of Team Hoyt. And in many ways, the most exciting moments at mile 10, where we are, come from the wheelchair racers. And the names we know best aren't the winners, but our friends who took on the challenge frequently for the sake of a charity. Now, the organizers may or may not do this, but the culture gives a trophy to everyone who finishes and one to everyone who starts. Winning is out of the question for all but a handful of women and men. But participating, being there, is possible and praiseworthy. So why is this? Why is it that the marathon holds this place in our culture? I think it's because it points to something greater. I think it's because it points back to those same ideals that we see in our Bible readings today. Now, we know some things about Paul that might be helpful here. First, he wasn't a professional prophet. He actually had another job, making tents. It was a skilled and strenuous occupation. This was before synthetic textiles. And we also know that he suffered from some sort of chronic illness that was obvious enough to his followers that he would mention it in his letters, but he didn't feel like he had to describe it in detail. And finally, he represented a religious minority that was weak and unpopular. And this weakness and this unpopularity eventually got him imprisoned and killed. So as a person of some strength and some limitations, like all the rest of us, he probably knew what it was like to come in second or third or 129th or to not finish the race. And that, that feeling is the drama of life in his world and in ours. But what matters and what prophets talk about is a race we can all win, namely the one where we do our best, to be the best we can be. You see, we too believe in the broad church and the inherent worth and dignity of every person. And we all participate in the exercise of pushing ourselves and helping others to move further, to go up higher. We all find ourselves on a team that can and does improve with each passing hour. And the marathon, just like scripture, provides us with the drama that life brings, highlights the struggles, both of those elite runners way up in front and of people like us. It is, in its own way, a text to read, to find meaning and strength for our lives. The race may not really be a religion, but there are ways in which it is religious, ways in which this great race connects us to each other and to our deepest selves. Whether that race is the huge one tomorrow or just two people springing from the car to the front door, the great race helps us to tell our story and encourage us on our journey.